welcome back. So last time we were introduced to the Elizabethan era, the method of playwriting which became popular, and so forth. What we're going to talk about here today are the actual theaters. This is, this is kind of exciting, again, from a historical point of view, because during the Elizabethan era, this is the first time, really, since the Greeks, that permanent structures are going to be built specifically to hold theater. Even during the Roman era, the, most of the playhouses and whatnot were later converted, or they would perform things at the Colosseum, or what have you. And as we discussed with the Middle Ages and the Italian Renaissance, the plays that were being done were mostly being done out of show wagons where people got in and traveled around and set up shop and had kind of a makeshift stage. So for the first time in centuries, actual theaters are being built. And these are going to kind of become the basis for our modern day theaters. It took them a little while to get there. As plays began to become more popular, as more and more people kind of wanted to see these things, where they were originally performed were um, in what they would call bear baiting rings. If you remember back to when we were talking about the Romans and their love of animal acts, one of the things they would do is get an animal and chain it to a post and basically have you know, gladiators and whatnot taunt the thing until finally tease until finally killing it. And <clears throat> as barbaric as it sounds, that was still a big form of entertainment during the Elizabethan era, only they would do it mostly with bears. So they would have huge arenas set up basically to stake these poor animals down and taunt them or sick dogs on them and whatnot until they were finally killed. Well, uh, most of the early shows that were being produced were being produced in uh, bear baiting rings that had been adapted to become stages. They would also do things in pubs or any place where there was an open area where the plays could be performed. It is also important to note that as theaters began to be constructed, that they had to be built outside of the city limits. Despite the fact that theater was the most popular form of entertainment, despite the fact that it now had uh, sponsorship from pretty high up and patronage from pretty high up. Remember, the queen loved theater. It was still looked down on by the moral leaders of the community. It was still looked at as a den of sin. So theaters could not be built within the city limits. And there are several stories of, you know, theaters kind of being built outside of the city limits and then the city kind of sprouting up around them and growing. And now the city limits are extended and now you have a theater that's not allowed to be there. There is a, one of the great theatrical legends. How true this is, I don't know. But it's a story I heard, and uh, it is, I believe it to be true because it sounds exactly like something a theater person would do. Um, most of the theaters of this time were built by a gentleman named Richard Burbage, and we are going to talk more about Richard Burbage in the next video as we discuss acting companies. Uh, Richard Burbage was one of the premier actors of this time, and he and his brother Cuthbert built and owned most of the theaters from this time period. Well, one of the legends goes that one of their theaters, and I cannot remember which one specifically, was built to code, was built outside the city limits. The city sprung up around it. There is a, uh, a river running between it and an open field across the way. And, of course, the city sprung up around it, so now they were not allowed to have their theater there anymore. So what they did was they waited for winter. Winter came, the, la the river froze, and according to legend, uh, Richard Burbage, Cuthbert Burbage, and some of their friends went out to the theater 
broke it down piece by piece, slid it across the frozen river, and rebuilt it on the other side. Again, how, how true that story is, I cannot attest. But it sounds exactly like something a spiteful theater person would totally do. So let's take a look at these structures, at some of the important theaters, and how these things actually looked and the seating arrangements that you'd find inside. So let's just talk about some of the important theaters that were constructed during this time period. Again, most of them being built by Richard and Cuthbert Burbage. We had the simply named The Theater in 1576. You had The Curtain in 1577. The Swan in 1595. and The Rose in 1587. Now, one thing I would like to call your attention to, if you look at any of these theaters, one thing you are going to notice is that they all have a flagpole. All of the illustrations you've just seen have a flag sticking out of them. This was used to inform the population of what type of play was being performed that night. A different color flag meant a different style or different genre of production so that people knew what they were in for. There was a white flag for when they would be performing comedies, a black flag for when they would be performing tragedies, and a red flag for when they would be performing histories. Probably the most famous Elizabethan theater would be the Globe, constructed in 1599. The Globe Theater was, as were most of the theaters of the time, constructed by Richard and Cuthbert Burbage. Why we are taking so long on this one, as opposed to the others that we just kind of zipped past, is that, of course, the Globe was the theater of William Shakespeare's theater company, The Lord Chamberlain's Men. So this was built specifically for them. This is kind of the mascot for all Elizabethan theaters. A reconstruction of the Globe Theater still stands in London and still produces shows every year. You can actually go to the Globe Theater, a replica of the Globe Theater, and see a production done in the style of the Elizabethans. So let's take a look at the actual construction of one of these theaters and the staging area. So here we have a diagram of the Globe Theater cut in half so we can see into it and see how this was set up. Couple things to point out. First of all, notice that the stage area juts out into the audience. So all of the theaters of the Elizabethan era were thrust stages. So remember that is a stage that again juts out into the audience and can have audience on three sides of it. You can see from the diagram that there is a little trap door built into the floor of the stage. So characters can make surprising entrances and exits. This was especially useful in situations where the play called for a supernatural character to suddenly appear, or in some instances for a character to be dragged down into the underworld or things of that nature. You can see that the stage actually has a backdrop that's two levels up. You can see an upper stage and a lower stage. So you could have actors leaning out of windows and performing scenes on an upper level. This is one of the first times in history we see this. We had something similar with the skein back in the Greek theaters, but these were a lot more intricate and a lot more interactive. You can imagine the famous balcony scene from Romeo and Juliet being seen here. You can also see several doors leading on and off stage. 
you can get a little bit of a look at the backstage area, which were surprisingly narrow. So you had to really squeeze in there, or you had to wait outside of the theater in a little waiting area for your queue. We're going to talk about that in a second. And once again, you can see the flag up there to indicate to the audience what type of show they were going to see that day. One other thing to note about all of the theaters from the Elizabethan era, they were all open air theaters. So in other words, there was a big hole in the roof so that they could use natural light for illumination. In the very instance where a production was performed at night, they would use torchlight. As for the audience, they had basically two options of where they could view the show. The first was called The Pit, and this was literally the floor of the theater. And for a penny, you could pay and stand and watch the show being performed. So yes, you had to stand the entirety of the show if you were viewing it from the pit. This was usually the location where the working class or lower class citizens would see the production. If you were watching a production from the pit, you were given the name groundlings. So please make sure you note that in your vocabulary. A groundling is a person who stands on the floor of the theater in the pit to view the show. And your other option for seating, if you were a little bit more well-to-do and could spare a few extra coins, you could sit in the upper levels, and these were called the galleries. These were one long continuous bench that ran the entire perimeter of the staging area. If you paid a couple other pennies, you might be able to purchase a cushion to sit on during the production. Some of these theaters had special boxes that were set aside for lords and ladies. If they wanted to come see the show and didn't want to mingle with the commoners, again, much like we have sky boxes and private boxes set up in sports arenas now, same basic theory. Obviously, you couldn't pay to sit in there. Those were reserved just in case anybody famous decided they wanted to come see the show that day. Okay, so before we wrap up, there is one last little tidbit of information that I want to share with you. This is a question that a lot of people are always asking, and yet very few people know the answer to. Well, I'm going to share the answer with you right now. And for those of you who have been in plays or think you might want to be in a play later on, you're going to encounter this area of the theater, and people are going to ask, how did it get its name? What we are going to see as we move forward in history is that as the theater structure itself evolves, they are going to take elements from the Elizabethan theaters to incorporate into modern day theaters. One such thing is a room that you'll find in every theater. It's called the Green Room. The green room is a place where actors gather, they can relax, there's usually sofas or something of that nature. This is basically where the actors wait to go on stage. This is their waiting room. Um, if you are in a play and you are only in one scene or one act, you can sometimes be in the green room for a very, very long time. Just about every major theater, be it live theater or televised theater has a green room. If you go to a news station, if you're a guest on a talk show, the place where you wait is the green room. And of course, the question that always comes up is, why is it called the green room? It's not painted green. Well, again, this is one of those questions that everybody in the theater asks, and yet very few people know the answer to. Where this term comes from, if you remember when we were taking a look at the diagram 
of the Globe Theater. One of the things I pointed out is that there's very little room in the backstage area. This can become an issue when you've got 20 to 30 actors all crammed into one place. They can't fit back there and still allow passways for the people trying to get on and off stage. So there would be a door in most Elizabethan theaters that you could open and it would lead to an area just outside of the theater, towards the rear of it. And you could go out there and wait out there. You could still hear everything that was going on on stage and you could still hear your cue so you knew when you had to come back in to get on stage. And this area, because it was outside, was called the green. So when theaters became indoor theaters, they still had this room where the actors could wait, only now it was called the green room. Thank you.